Did you know that one of the biggest religious monuments on earth was built on a foundation of sand? Most people imagine a temple resting on solid rock, but in Cambodia, the builders of Angkor Wat chose an unstable, watery landscape. In this video, we unpack the engineering secrets that allowed millions of stones to sit on soft ground for eight centuries. You will learn how ancient Khmer engineers controlled rivers, balanced water levels, and aligned their temple with the cosmos. You will see how their choices shaped daily life for hundreds of thousands of people and why they still matter today. Today, we will explore how climate change and tourism now threaten these secrets and what we can learn from the past. Angkor Wat is located near the town of Siem Reap in northwestern Cambodia. Built in the early 12th century under King Suryavarman II, it served both as a state temple and as his mausoleum. The outer wall encloses an area of about 820 by 1024 meters, and the highest tower rises about 65 meters. Yet beneath this massive structure lies no granite or bedrock. Instead, workers laid down thick beds of sand mixed with laterite and clay. They saturated this mixture with water to make it cohesive. Above the sand, they set heavy laterite blocks and then the sandstone blocks that form the visible temple. To appreciate why sand and water were used, think about the climate. Cambodia has a tropical monsoon pattern. The wet season brings months of intense rain, while the dry season sees long periods with little precipitation. The soil around Angkor is loose and sandy. During rainstorms, water can erode foundations. During droughts, dry sand can shift and collapse. The challenge for Khmer builders was to create a foundation that could withstand both extremes. Their solution was to treat water as part of the structural system rather than a threat. As a result, understanding the water management around Angkor is key to unlocking its engineering secrets. The first engineering insight at Angkor Wat is that water, not stone, keeps the temple stable. Apsara, the Cambodian authority managing the site, explains that the temple's foundation relies on a balance between wet and dry sand. The builders dug a wide moat around the temple, almost 200 meters across and more than 4 meters deep, to serve as a hydraulic buffer. During the monsoon, this moat captured excess rainwater, preventing floods from undermining the walls. During the dry season, water slowly seeped from the moat into the surrounding sand to keep it moist. If the sand dried out completely, it would shrink and cause cracks in the stone. If it became oversaturated, the weight of the temple might cause subsidence. By carefully regulating the water level, the Khmer turned an unpredictable environment into a controlled support system. This principle extends beyond Angkor Wat. Smaller temples across the Angkor Plain were designed with moats or ponds sized in proportion to the building. Modern hydrologists have observed that when these moats are inadequate or allowed to dry out, the structures begin to lean or crack. In other words, the width of the moat wasn't just for decoration or ritual, it was a deliberate structural choice. This insight also explains why tourist developments that pump large volumes of groundwater near Angkor can threaten the temples. Removing water lowers the water table, dries out the sand mixture, and weakens the foundation. To maintain a constant supply of water, Khmer engineers did more than build moats. They redesigned entire rivers. In the 10th century, they diverted the Puak River, channeling it eastward for about 80 kilometers to feed the Angkor region. They canalized the Roluos River as well, carving straight channels that connected to the temple moats. This canal work ensured a year-round flow of water in both dry and wet seasons. Perhaps the most impressive parts of Angkor's water system were the berets, or reservoirs. The east beret measured about 1.8 by 7.5 kilometers, while the west beret was approximately 2.1 by 7.8 kilometers. Each held hundreds of millions of cubic meters of water. According to archaeologists, these reservoirs allowed farmers to grow multiple crops of rice per year, rather than relying on a single harvest. They also acted as surge tanks during floods and as storage during droughts. One modern hydrologist from Apsara estimates that the combined capacity of the reservoirs and moats around Angkor Wat could hold at least 120 million cubic meters of water. Without this storage, life on the Angkor Plain would have oscillated between flood and famine. While water management ensured structural stability, Angkor Wat also served as a cosmic instrument. Unlike most Khmer temples, which face east, Angkor Wat faces west. Scholars believe this orientation may relate to the Hindu god Vishnu, or to funerary symbolism. But researchers have discovered that the temple's layout encodes astronomical cycles. On the mornings of the spring and autumn equinoxes, the rising sun aligns directly with the central tower when viewed from the western entrance. 
The bas-reliefs contain counts of days between solstices and equinoxes. Measurements across the galleries correspond to lunar and solar cycles. In short, Angkor Wat was not only a religious structure, but a stone calendar. Why does this matter for engineering? Because aligning a building with celestial events requires precise surveying and orientation. The builders had to position the temple so that twice a year, the sunrise would pass exactly above the central tower. This level of accuracy implies knowledge of solar motion and careful observation. It also shows that the Khmer were not simply stacking stones. They were inscribing cosmology into architecture. For those interested in astronomy, this intersection of science and spirituality is another layer of the temple's allure. The scale of Angkor Wat can be measured not just in stones and canals, but in people. Legends speak of 300,000 laborers and 6,000 elephants involved in its construction. Modern historians caution against taking these numbers literally, but it is clear that tens of thousands of workers were mobilized over decades. Workers quarried sandstone at Mount Kulin over 40 kilometers away, carved blocks to shape, transported them by raft down the Seam Reap River, then dragged them across land on rollers. They erected wooden scaffolding, used ropes and levers to hoist stones, and carved intricate bas-reliefs depicting scenes from Hindu epics. What was it like to live near Angkor Wat at its peak? Imagine a landscape of rice paddies crisscrossed with canals. Farmers would wake before dawn to check irrigation channels and ensure that gates were open or closed according to need. Boatmen would ferry goods along waterways, avoiding muddy roads during the wet season. At the temple itself, priests and officials performed rituals while craftsmen carved and repaired stone. Children might learn to swim in ponds carved by their ancestors. Festivals such as Bonham Tuk, the water festival, involved boat races and the release of candles on the waterways. Water was more than infrastructure. It was woven into every aspect of culture. Understanding this intimate relationship helps us see the temple not as a static monument, but as the centerpiece of a living, breathing city. However, no system lasts forever. Starting in the 14th century, climate records show that Southeast Asia experienced a series of mega droughts followed by periods of intense monsoon flooding. Droughts lowered water levels in the reservoirs, making it difficult to irrigate rice fields. Floods brought silt and debris that clogged canals and spillways. Maintaining the system required constant labor. As political instability grew and external threats increased, labor and resources were diverted away from canal maintenance. Sediment built up, banks eroded, channels filled with vegetation. Over decades, these small failures snowballed. Rice yields declined, undermining the surplus necessary to support temple upkeep and a large population. Sometime in the 15th century, the royal court relocated south and Angkor's status as a political capital diminished. However, small communities continued to live around the temples, and Angkor Wat became a Buddhist monastery rather than a Hindu state temple. Some popular stories describe Angkor as abandoned and lost to the jungle. In reality, local people never forgot it. They preserved its shrines and used its structures. European explorers in the 19th century thought they had discovered a lost city, but the Cambodian people knew it well. The decline of Angkor is better understood as a gradual transformation driven by climate stress, social change, and shifts in trade routes. Its hydraulic system decayed, but did not disappear. Today, archaeologists use airborne laser scanning, LIDAR, to map the remnants of canals and reservoirs hidden beneath the forest canopy, revealing the vast extent of the medieval city. Fast forward to the 20th and 21st centuries. Angkor Wat attracts millions of visitors each year, boosting the local economy but placing new stresses on the environment. Hotels and businesses around Seam Reap pump groundwater to supply bathrooms, kitchens, and swimming pools. As the water table drops, the sand underneath the temple dries out. Without sufficient moisture, the sand cannot support the heavy stone, and cracks may form. Conservation agencies monitor the groundwater and attempt to regulate extraction. Some hotels have been connected to surface water reservoirs to reduce groundwater pumping. But enforcement is difficult, and climate change introduces further uncertainty. Rainfall patterns are shifting, and extreme weather events are more more common. Conservators also face the challenge of balancing tourism with preservation. Thousands of feet walking over ancient stones cause wear, and humidity from breathing can contribute to mold growth in enclosed spaces. Meanwhile, the surrounding landscape is still home to thousands of residents who need water for farming and drinking. In short, the same question that ancient engineers faced, how to balance human needs with environmental realities, persists today. The story of Angkor Wat holds lessons that extend far beyond Cambodia. 
First, it shows that innovative engineering can arise in any culture. Long before modern hydraulics, the Khmer understood how to divert rivers, store water, and stabilize sand. They turned a challenging landscape into a sustainable home for hundreds of thousands of people. Second, it reminds us that environmental conditions can change rapidly. The same monsoon cycle that sustained Angkor eventually contributed to its decline when climate variability increased. Third, it warns that even sophisticated systems require continual maintenance and social investment. When political will or economic resources dwindle, infrastructure decays. For modern viewers, these lessons are timely. Many cities today rely on massive hydraulic systems, dams, reservoirs, storm drains, and groundwater pumping. Urban planners wrestle with rising seas, drought, and climate change. The balance between development and preservation is also a pressing issue. How do we support local economies through tourism while protecting fragile sites? How do we share water among agriculture, industry, and households without causing environmental damage? By studying Angkor, we can see that the answers involve both engineering and governance. Let's recap. Angkor Wat is not just a temple, it is a masterclass in hydrology. Its builders used sand, water, canals, and reservoirs to create a stable foundation in a monsoon climate. They diverted rivers and built massive berets to ensure a year-round water supply. They aligned their temple with the cosmos, turning it into a stone calendar. They mobilized thousands of workers and integrated water management into daily life. When climate and social stresses mounted, the system faltered, but the monument endured. As a viewer, what part of this story surprised you most? Was it the idea that water is part of the structure? The scale of the reservoirs? The astronomical alignments? Leave a comment and let us know. If you enjoyed this explanation, consider subscribing for more deep dives into the hidden engineering of history. Future episodes will explore how the builders of Great Zimbabwe erected mortarless walls that still stand, or how Machu Picchu's terraces keep a mountain city from sliding into the valley. By subscribing, you'll join a community of curious minds who believe that understanding the past can help us build a better future. Finally, if you ever visit Angkor Wat, remember that it is much more than a photo backdrop. Look beyond the carvings to the moats, canals, and reservoirs. Notice how the stone sits above damp sand and how water drains through it. Appreciate the complex relationship between humans and their environment. The engineering secrets of Angkor are not hidden. They are all around, waiting for you to see them.